Good morning. So good morning and welcome to the 16th Annual Regional Pediatric Nursing Conference hosted by Nursing and Children Network, the local chapter of the Society of Pediatric Nurses. My name is Tracy Patrick Cancelli. I'm the conference chairperson and I'm also the coordinator of continuing nursing education at the Morris Alfred I. DuPont Hospital for Children here in Wilmington. Our conference theme this year is Pediatric Nurses, Trusted Voices, Partners, and Excellence. To me, these words reflect the close connection we have with our patients and their families, particularly those who are the most vulnerable. They are the ones who turn to us for help at extremely challenging times in their lives. They count on us to safeguard them, to promote and restore their health, and to be their partners in all aspects of their care. A group of seasoned nurses from multiple healthcare organizations throughout the Delaware Valley who represent pediatric healthcare throughout the continuum has planned today's conference. Planning an event such as this is a year-long process that requires a significant dedication of time, professional expertise, and creativity. I'm extremely grateful to the planning committee members for their contributions. You can see their names and their faces on the screens behind me. I hope that you'll take a minute to say hello to them today and to thank them for their work. As you may know, the Nursing and Children Network hosts an annual essay contest for student nurses. Entrants are asked to submit essays describing why they want to go into pediatric nursing. The entries are then judged and a winner is selected. In addition to earning a free registration for this conference, the winner also receives a free membership to SPN and NCN. I am pleased to announce that our winner this year is a student at Westchester University, Bryce Gannon. Bryce, will you please stand so we can give you a round of applause. Congratulations. I wish you great success as you complete your education in nursing, and I hope that you'll feel encouraged and supported by the many experienced nurses here today. All of you can find out more about Bryce as well as read his winning essay on our mobile app. Downloaded and taken a look at. As we begin our day together, I want to remind you of the multiple learning opportunities that are available. There are 24 concurrent sessions from which to choose throughout the day. As you know, mental health issues are extremely prevalent in our society, and your feedback about our conference last year told us that you wanted a lot more content on mental health topics. Many healthcare professionals' perspectives throughout today will augment our keynote speaker's deeply personal perspective on mental health. As you look over at the conference agenda on our mobile app, please take advantage of the many concurrent sessions or our roundtable uh, discussion this morning that focus on mental health topics. We also have a poster session going on in the lobby for which you can earn an additional contact hour. The poster evaluation forms are available at the registration desk, and uh, please uh, turn those back in completed uh, by the end of the day in order to receive the additional one contact hour for the posters. At our 10.15 break this morning, you can visit with the poster authors and engage in discussion with them about their projects. The posters will also be judged and we will be awarding prizes, so I hope you'll join me in the lobby at 3.25 this afternoon for the announcement of the poster winners. Um, as I mentioned, we are having a series of roundtable discussions at the 10.15 break this morning, and the topics and facilitators for those are listed in the mobile app. If you did not pre-register for one of those sessions but decide you would like to attend, please check in with the room moderator when you arrive at the room and we'll just make sure that we have seating available. I also hope you'll take advantage of the opportunity to speak with our partners in Governor's Hall about their products and services. Their organizations have provided significant financial support for this conference and we're very grateful for that. New at the conference this year is the opportunity to attend a product presentation from one of our partners. Four of these sessions are being offered, three during our extended lunch period, and one at the end of the day. The end of the day presentation offered by Ergo is a repeated session from the one they're providing during lunch. So if you don't, need, in case you don't, need to, you don't, don't get to attend at lunch, you could go to the same session at the end of the day. Those four sessions do not award continuing education credit. However, the partners providing them will be offering a raffle prize during their sessions. So you have a great opportunity to win, and you can also um, have your dessert during one of those sessions um, in one of those smaller rooms in a quieter setting. Finally, I encourage you to visit the community service and NCN tables in the lobby to either donate clothing items to the Cradles to Crayons program 
and also to find out more about the benefits of joining MCN. Um, and now, at this time, I would like to introduce storyteller, author, and filmmaker Kevin Hines. Before we hear from Kevin, let's take a look at the trailer for his new film. Are you okay? Is something wrong, or can I help you? Those were the words that I desperately wanted to hear right before I catapulted myself over the rail. I have now lived 15 years past the day I should have died. When you see a lot of mental illness being expressed, that's a clue that the culture is sick, not the person. Hey brother, hello Kevin. You were the first person to ever say, you know Kevin, you should talk about this. Our guest, Kevin Hines, one of the 200 feet but survived. Today I travel the globe spreading a message of hope. Why? Because we know it helps people heal. There's a huge opportunity as we talk about stories of survival to support people that are out there. I break down on a regular basis. I have symptoms every day. Um, I still have hallucinations both auditory and visual. Families of those who jump from the iconic structure urge to stop the suicides. One person goes to this bridge to die every seven to ten days. I think it's our obligation to stop them. You go to Paris, you go to New York, you go to Istanbul, there are suicide areas. The more people that know about the horror of that bridge, the more pressure will be put to do something to stop it. Will this really decrease suicides, you think? They say things like, why ruin the aesthetics? What are the aesthetics of the compared to what you would like? Kevin Hines, there's no telling how many lives were saved by you because you were able to take your own. Let's get to that place that nobody is being brave or talks about their brain disease. They're just being honest. My name is Kevin Hines, and this is my story. Good morning. Great to be here with all of you, and thank you for having me today. Before I begin to share with all of you my story, there's something that we must do. Right here, right now, and together. We must take a moment of silence for all of those that we have lost to death by suicide from lethal emotional pain. In my short 38 years on this beautiful planet, I've lost eight people I loved this pain, not the least of which was my biological mother, Marcia, may she rest in peace, and not the most recent of which were three of the greatest brain health and suicide prevention advocates this world has ever known. And two of them called me before they passed away, telling me they were going to be fine. But today, my new friends is not about the way they died or the day they died. Today is about how they lived before they ever got sick in the first place. Today is about the beauty that they were and the light that exuded from within them when they were still here. And today we must choose to hold immeasurable gratitude for the very little time we had with them. I celebrate and honor those I lost and I loved to suicide on their birthday with people that love them just as much as I do. Because the only way to properly grieve a suicide is together, without blame, and with no guilt. It doesn't belong to us. They did not die because of us or in spite of us. They died because of an unrelenting, lethal emotional pain that had nothing to do with us. I honor their memories. Let's hold them dear. Let's hold immeasurable gratitude for the very little time we had with them. And I'll tell you this, I celebrate the lives of those eight I lost, and I do it with gluten-free cake and a candle, because that's how I roll. Let us honor their memory, and if you would indulge me, please, if you're physically capable, please stand in silence for all of those that we have lost this way.
Thank you. Please sit down. He is ancient yet ageless. He is ticking yet timeless. He runs, not hunted, he chases. He is a man of many faces. He is the darkness. I am the light. I may be cracked, but I will never be broken. I wrote that limerick in eighth grade about the intense duality I felt inside since fourth grade. Fourth grade was the first time I ever heard auditory hallucinations in my head. Do you think I told anybody? No, I buried it and I was quiet about my pain. In fourth grade, I also was bullied, hazed, and teased, and tormented by the eighth graders relentlessly. But in order to do this story any justice, we have to stop right here, and we have to go all the way back to the very beginning, the day I was born. Born August 30th, 1981, in the great city of San Francisco in the beautiful state of California. I was born to biological parents, Marcia Silvetta and Martino Perales. He was half Mexican and half Italian, arguably the best parts of me. And Marcia hailed from James Bond Island, Jamaica, in St. Mary's Island. And Marcia and Martino found each other and fell in love in the 1970s in San Francisco in the post-hippie era, and they were hippies through and through. I'm talking headbands, tie-dye shirts, and everything in between. And Marcia and Martino had a couple of things going for them. They had their immeasurable love for one another, and that same unconditional love for their two, in my humble opinion, beautiful baby boys, me and my brother. My name wasn't always Kevin Hines. That is my adopted name. My biological name is Giovanni Gabriel Prasad Perales. Say that 10 times fast. <laughs> I've got four names, but somehow my brother's name was just Jordash. What the hell? Anyway, <laughs> where's the consistency, mom and dad? And so my biological mom and dad, they had a couple things going for them, but they had a great many things going against them. They had no feasible legal income. They had to hustle to survive. We lived in places with concrete slab floors, box springs for mattresses, the kind of places you paid for by the hour, and if you didn't, you were out. And my mom and dad did whatever they had to do to pay on that hour by that hour, however illegal. They did scored and sold drugs. That was their life. That was our life. In order to do score and sell drugs, that meant they would have to leave their boys unattended to go do those things. Their infant child, children, that meant that when they left us unattended over a concrete slab floor, we could have fallen and cracked our heads over. Lying with dangerous drug paraphernalia on those beds, had we touched and killed us. This is where our lives began. And one fateful day, one seedy motel clerk made his most unseedy decision. He heard our screams and our cries and his mind went too many times and did us the first solid anybody ever would. He called the police. And the police came to a child protective services, and they swooped us up smelling sour and putrid, they said. And the court documents on that day read, and I quote, the children lie there, in their own filth, screaming and crying, not to be neglected, barely clothed, not even a diaper. Humble beginnings. My mom and dad loved us. They wanted to protect us. They did what they had to to keep us safe, to the best of their ability but they have been diagnosed in their day with manic depression, what we today call bipolar, bipolar disorder, the very same brain disease both my, both my, I would be diagnosed with at 17 and a half years of age, two years prior to jumping off of that bridge. My birth parents saw me taken away from them. They took us into protective custody, they placed us into the foster care system, a system in the 1970s and 80s that was in shambles. A system allowing kids to age out to 18 in the homelessness onto the streets without a penny in their pockets. A system allowing kids to be abused or neglected by the very foster parents set to protect them. A system for all the good it does in this world still allows for both of those things to occur. Now my brother and I would bounce around from home to home, having a new mom and dad every couple of weeks or days. The idea was that my brother Jordash and I would be adopted together. By the way, they say Jordash looked exactly like me, down to the freckles with blonde curly hair. Can you see it? <laughs> when I grow my hair out, it's going to be an auburn red. 
My brother and I were supposed to be adopted together. Do you think that's what happened? Yeah. No, not by a long shot. We both got a vicious strain of bronchitis, the same strain of bronchitis, and Jordash died. And people have said to me quite callously as an adult, Kevin, why does that matter? You were an infant. How did that affect you? You all know, given what you do as nurses, you know the first three to nine months of any infant's life are the most crucial for their ability to connect, adapt, attach, and be well in any future. And if the first three to nine months of your life are fraught with nothing but consistent trauma, at some point something's got to give and you're going to have a hell of a hard time. I will tell you that in the first nine months of my life, I was fed with mom and dad to steal. Kool-Aid, Coca-Cola, and sour milk with my first diet. I had a descended belly filled with liquid, a bruise from the top of my sternum to the bottom of my abdomen from being malnourished. My brother passed away, I bounced around from home to home, but not without severe abandonment issues and a detachment disorder that would follow me until today. Every time somebody I love dies, I feel like they're leaving me on purpose, and somehow I can't shake it no matter how much therapy I do. I do a lot of therapy. I would bounce around from home to home. I would land at the home of one Peter and Deborah Mullen. Peter was in the Army, often had to be restationed. Debbie was a housewife. They were a transitional home for kids, multiple kids at the same time, uh, you know, kids of all ages, boys and girls, maybe six or seven little girls, four or five little boys in their house. It was pandemonium. They loved it. They were good foster parents. They do exist. And, and, and Peter and Deborah Muller would take care of would take care of me until one fateful day when a beautiful, lovely, amazing nurse would walk in their door named Deborah Joan Hines. 45-year nurse today in San Francisco. Debbie Hines would walk in their door. Spoiler alert, you see my last name up there. It just works out. <laughs> Debbie Hines walks in their door, but she is fully expecting to take home a little girl be the sister of Elizabeth Catherine, the girl she and Patrick Kevin Hines had already taken in. They wanted to give Elizabeth a sister. Well, I look like a sister to you. <laughs> now, to be fair, I said this in a high school setting in Australia once, and this kid right in the middle, in the middle, does his gangster lean back and says, yes, <laughs> in an Australian accent. So I lean forward and said, son, clearly two things. You're confused, and you need glasses, but this is a speech, and you're not giving it. We have to move on. <laughs> Nonetheless, if Debbie Hines walked in that door looking for a little girl to take home, she had quite a few to choose from. But the first thing she saw on the carpeted floor before her, red-headed, wavy-haired Giovanni with my famous red rubber ducky overalls. <laughs> Bought a pair, you just don't remember. And she said that was the moment, in her journal of those days, she said that was the moment she fell in love. And she went back to Patrick and Kevin Hines, and he said, let's do it. Let's take him in. Why? Because he needs us. And I desperately needed them. And they took me in at nine months of age, and I was violently ill all day, every day, for the next 30 days. No doctor or nurse or practitioner could tell Patrick and Deborah what was wrong with their new-to-be son. One specialist came forward and said, there's nothing physically wrong with this child. It's all emotional. But that wasn't true. My stomach lining was nil from being fed Kool-Aid, Coca-Cola, and sour milk was my first diet. My brain functioning was terrible because of my poor gut to brain health. From the very beginning, I was mentally unwell. From the very beginning. And uh, finally, on the 30th day of being in the Heinz home, Debbie would come to my crib, she would lean in, and she would say, Geo, you're safe. We're not going anywhere. But if you don't knock this off, we're going to give you back. Which is a complete contradiction, Mom. But she said that was the first night as if my infant mind had heard and understood her words that we both slept soundly in 30 days. And she came to my crib the next morning and she looked down and she said that was the moment I smiled at her for the first time. Now, we all know what that was. That was gas, okay? That's what she was but she, to her, it was the moment we had. Patrick and Deborah Hines would go ahead and adopt me and Elizabeth on March 17, 1986, St. Patty's Day. They would adopt me and, and my sister and make us their children. They would take in another child from a different family a few, uh, a little bit later, uh, and his name was Joseph. We all had rough infancies. My brother himself was born addicted to crack cocaine. He has had the hardest life of anyone I have ever known until today. 
living with Asperger's syndrome. My sister Elizabeth, her mom and dad, her mom had uh, multiple personality disorder, and we all had it rough. Each of us would see the inside of psych wards three times before we were 30 years of age. Why? Because of our brains. Your brain is the single most powerful organ you wield. It is mostly on automatic mode. It controls every action and inaction you take, every decision and indecision. It controls, for lack of a better term, every other organ in the body. If the brain is malfunctioning, my friends, there goes the rest of you. At 17 and a half years of age, I would stand on a stage at Archbishop Reardon High School, the school my father Patrick went to. It was my only choice. Uh, if I didn't get in, I wasn't going to go anywhere. <laughs> I stood on a stage at Archbishop Reardon High School at 17 and a half years of age. Believing before that, that you know, I'd grow up and I'd have this great uh, school to go to, like my dad's always talking about. I did the great job he's always speaking of. You know, he was an economist, my mom was a nurse, noble professions, I could be one of those two things. But there I was on the stage at 17 and a half, looking out into a crowd of 1,200 people. I was, I was a theater kid. Any theater kids in the building? You see, you see one. Not one. He's a nurse to the core, it's okay, all right? All right, that's fine. I was a theater kid, and uh, among other things, I was WCAL wrestling champion. Our football team had gone to state, I was on it. Uh, I was on the speech and debate team, albeit for two days before they kicked me off, but I was there. <laughs> and I'm on, I'm on stage at this play, and I'm, uh, it's a musical actually, and I'm playing the character called Gatch in the show How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. Gatch was a philandering businessman. He had the wife at home, uh, but he was messing around with all the secretaries in the office. We all know that guy. And uh, Gatch was a total, he was a jerk, and my friend said I played him well, I didn't appreciate it. <laughs> I'm on that stage wearing my father Patrick's old suit and tie that sort of happened to fit me. This is the thing. Patrick Kevin Hines is 6'1". I know you can't tell. I'm not. I'm not 6'1", but you have no idea because I'm a very tall 5'7". That's right. 5'7 and a quarter, that's a real thing. I'm a tall person. Anyway, I'm on that stage and I believe in a fit of extreme paranoid delusion, the first of my severe symptoms of the disease that would let say I had called bipolar. Type 1 with psychotic features, a mouthful for any 17 year old. I believed that every single one of the 1,200 people in that audience was going to, at any moment, do one thing stand, rush the stage simultaneously to end my life. I believe they were coming to kill me. Let's stop right there. What would y'all do if you thought 1,200 people were coming to kill you at once? Any audible answer will do, go. Run, thank you. You said run. What's your name? Lisa said, run, Lisa got the prize. Give Lisa a round of applause, please. <laughs> Lisa, just to be clear, there's no prize. But you're a winner, and that's what counts, okay? You're a champion. Champion Lisa. All right, so I ran off stage. I ran to the lobby where I was met with by Mr. John Fennell. John Fennell was the theater director. He was a, he was a, he was a failed actor turned high school thespian director. <laughs> but he was the best teacher any of us kids would ever have. He was the best teacher for thousands of kids across 20 years in the San Francisco Bay Area. And John Fennell was a character. He had this box haircut from 1987 in the year 1997, but his mustache was from 1962. <laughs> and it, it was charcoal gray from all the incessant smoking. And, uh, and John, it, 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 if you did anything other than what John told you to do on stage, He'd take his left thumb, he'd place it in the right corner of the pocket of his mouth, he'd pop it out, make a loud echoing popping sound throughout the entire theater. He would say, Heinz, he always called me Heinz. He would say, Heinz, that's the sound of your head coming out of your Anyway, that's, <laughs> that's what John Fennell would do. He would say that sentence to me on multiple occasions, but he would finish it completely. And uh, here's the thing, I always did things he didn't want me to do, so he said it quite often. Uh, as a matter of fact, do you know what blocking lines are? No, you're not theater kids, never mind. Blocking lines are when you make movements on stage, I would do mine backwards. <laughs> you would drive me bananas. Um, nonetheless, John meets me in the theater lobby, and he sits me down in the theater treasurer's chair. Can I take this chair for a minute? He sits me down in the theater treasurer's chair, let's just say this is it, which was very fitting, because at the time, I was the theater treasurer. Yes, that's right. The kid with no conceptual math skills, all the books were wrong, I blame John. Uh, also, uh, 
I, 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 the theater treasurer position I have maintained because I ran unopposed and I won because I'm a champion, like Lisa. And so there's that. And so John sits me down and he says, Heinz, and he's three sheets to the wind because John could never bear to watch his shows sober. John, like my biological parents, had substance use disorder. And uh, he, he would die by his hand. But that's a story we don't have time for. He was my hero. He was my mentor. He was my friend. He was a second father figure to me. But John sits me down and he says, Hi, can you please finish the performance? It's not even an admission yet. What are you doing? And I just babbled incoherent nonsense for the next 10 minutes. I could not make out three <coughs> words in a row that made sense. John, of course, called my mom. And Debbie Hines came to pick me up. And I'll never forget the look in her eyes as she gazed into mine because I could see the, that she could see within them the depths of insanity going by them. Very soon thereafter, I would go to see my first psychiatrist, Dr. J. Kevin Riss. Now, I have this feeling she only picked J. Kevin Riss because his name is J. Kevin and my name is J. Kevin, which is not how you pick a psychiatrist. <laughs> They said Dr. Rist was one of the best in the field, his secretary, his apprentice, people we didn't know who referred us to him. He's one of the best in the field. Dr. Rist himself would tell me every second, he would do this. Kevin, Kevin, let's do it again because it's annoying. Kevin, Kevin, one more time for posterity. Kevin, Kevin, I'm one of the best in the field. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you told me that like the last 17 sessions. You're also clearly a very humble man. <laughs> that was Dr. Rist. But he was, he was a good dude. He always wore these bright sweaters that were too bright, you know, the kinds from, from Christmas where you're like, hey, buddy, turn it down. And he wore khaki pleated cuffs, you know, with the pleated pants with the cuffs on the bottom, 1973. And, you know, my dad still wear those. I try to tell him, Dad, it's 2019. Flat fronts, please, no cuffs. He doesn't listen. Anyway, Dr. Riss was a good dude. He was trying to help me. But guess what? He also had substance use disorder. Followed me my whole life. Substance use disorder, he was on methamphetamine the entire time he treated me and his other patients. One of the best in the field. Now that I don't I don't blame him for this. I hold no ill will toward the man. He was very, very sick and he needed help and nobody knew it. He was silent in his pain, just like I was in fourth grade about those voices in my head. And Dr. Risk would die by his hands. The third person in my life to do so. And you know. People blamed him, and they came after him. His patients would file a class action lawsuit against him and his practice. He would lose everything. His wife and children would leave him, but his patients would take their house. They asked me to be a part of the, the, the lawsuit. I said, absolutely not. I was the only one to refuse. I said, he needs help. He needs hope before he passes. And nonetheless, he's gone. And. Uh, that's not indicative of psychiatry in the field of medicine. Psychiatry in the field of medicine has helped save my life for the better part of 20 years. But back then, a lot of people were going through a lot of help just to get to where they needed to be. A doctor was in a world of pain and nobody saw it. And I feel bad for that. I would go from 17 to 19 years of age on a rocky road. I would skyrocket every week into a euphoric, manic, natural high, not caused by recreational drugs, but caused by the misaligning chemistry in my brain. When I get, once you go up, though, you must come. Once you go up, you must come. And I would come crashing down to this dark abyss of pain. This place with this black cloud over my head, rain, hail, sleet, and snow, and I believed I was the only one. I thought I was solely alone, surrounded by a sea of people who actually loved me. I couldn't see it. I couldn't see the forest and the trees. I wish I knew back then what I know today when I went to that bridge. I wish I knew that my thoughts did not have to become my actions. Think about that for a moment. Our thoughts do not have to become our actions. Matter of fact, I'll say it, you say it after me. My thoughts, my thoughts. do not do not have to become, have to become my, action. my action. Now, if all of your thoughts became your actions, how many of you would be in jail right now for road rage? Come on, come on. Oh, that's that you're, you're lying to yourself that that's just two of you. Come on. All right, fair enough. If we can recognize that our thoughts do not have to own, rule, or define our next 
action, guess what? In the face of suicidal ideation, through self-awareness techniques, we can always remain right here. I, I represent someone who can understand that critically. I live with chronic thoughts of ending my life, but they'll never take me. I'll never die with my hands today, because today, every time I'm suicidal, I will say four simple but effective words. I need help now. And if I asked you for help, would you help me? Yes. Exactly. And so that's the thing people are missing in their minds when they're so drastically suicidal. They think they're a burden to everyone who's around them. This perceived burden to this that follows us with suicidal ideation is inaccurate. If we are to ask for help long enough to more to enough people, enough times over and over again, someone will be willing to sit by our side until we are safe. I can tell you that is been proven, proof positive, because I've done it so many times. But back to the story at hand. 17 to 19 years of age, these are the things that occur. I'm skyrocketing into manic and fork natural highs. I'm crashing into the dark abysses of depression every single week. At 18 years of age, my optimistic mother, Debbie Hines, by the way, one of the most optimistic people you'll ever meet on the face of the planet, this woman. As a matter of fact, growing up, her optimism knew no bounds. You know, you know the kind of optimism when you're a kid that's just so annoying. Mom, it's not that great of a day, stop smiling and calm down. That kind of optimism, right, you know? She was the type of person that could turn anything around so easily. Her glass was never half empty. It was never half full. It was toppling over with optimism. Uh, you know, I, when I was a kid in grade school, remember I told you about fourth grade, where the kids tormented me? Let me break it down. I'm part black. Because I was part black in an all-white school, this is what the eighth grade kids did to a fourth grade. They held my head down, held my head, held my head, held my head down, and said, "Swing the lever and swing," as in hit, try to hit them back. They pulled my ears from behind me as hard as they could, and said, "Whistle, little N-word whistle." Eighth graders to a fourth grader, or simply they wouldn't say anything at all. They'd pick me up, turn me upside down, and place me in a garbage can, face first, and say, "That's what I was." And I would come home to Debbie Hines, and this would be her reaction. Hand to her hip, and she'd do one of these. Oh, honey. I mean, she does this to make sense because she has hair. Oh, honey. Oh, well. No, Mom, it's not an oh, well situation. There were banana peels in the garbage can. And she'd say, oh, honey, oh, well. Let it go. She taught me life's most valued and greatest lesson. She taught me, Kevin, be kind, compassionate, loving, caring, empathetic and non-judgmental to every single person you ever come into contact with, no matter their behavior toward you. That's a tall order for a fourth grade kid, isn't it? But she taught me that from the very beginning. I didn't always meet the mark. I don't always meet the mark, but I try to, to, to heed those words. Because it is, it's, it's a beautiful thing that she taught me. She would leave me with positive affirmation sticky notes in every one of my lunch bags. So every time these things happened, I would go to my lunch bag and I would see Kevin, you're beautiful. Kevin, I love you. Kevin, you're the greatest. And it, it, it turned the tide of that pain. But I will tell you that the things those, those eighth grade kids did to me, and the kids even in my class did to me, uh, they had a causative factor in me jumping off of that bridge. Absolutely. In the depression that would lead to that death. From 17 to 18, it's on this rocky road. 18 years of age, my mom loses her optimism for me. Happened to me. I think it had something to do with the uh, all the dry, holes I punched in all of her drywalls. You know, I, I don't blame her one iota. She had to kick me out because she had two other kids to take care of. Debbie and Pat Hines adopted and took in three kids from three separate families into one, and we made a melting pot of a family. By the way, we didn't look like it. People noticed me. I told you I was mixed. You can think of me as everything but Russian. Let's go with that. Or as you know. My brother, black, my sister, white people, generally confused. When we were kids walking with my mom, women would cross the street to, to talk to my mom about us, and this is what they would do. They'd do a semicircle around us like some kind of lion fry. They'd lean in, they'd do one of these. They'd lean in closer, they'd say, excuse me, miss, and she would say, yes. And they would say, how did all of that happen? And that's when my mom would very quickly and happily reply, oh, you know, different fathers. <laughs> Epic because it was true. Give them behind the round of applause. <laughs> but back to the story at hand. I'm 18 years of age. She can 
bear my aggression and my violence no longer. She kicks me out and calls my father. Clothes on the porch in the rain, my dad comes to pick me up. Patrick Kevin Hines is no optimist. He's a pragmatic, pessimistic, and stone-faced man. He's a man void of true emotion most of my life. He's a real teddy bear, but don't tell him I said that. And Pat Hines, uh, he had a rough go at his uh, childhood and infancy. He says, his mom and dad had, guess what, substance use disorder. Good job. <laughs> they, had, they had substance use disorder, and his mom and dad would die of liver cirrhosis, liver failure at very young ages. You see, it, 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 it ran through the entire Hines and Ryan family. As a matter of fact, Kevin Joseph Ryan, his uncle, my great uncle, Kevin Joseph Ryan, who I'm named after, who he's named after, uh, would be 30 years drunk during his life and be no good to him, but would be 30 years sober during mine and be my best friend. I would go to Uncle Kevin's last 10 chips at AA before he passed. I would grow up in AA as a kid, learning to tell stories just right there in AA. Not being a part of it, being, but being physically there. And, uh, Uncle Kevin was of nine children, two stillborn, seven remain, five would die of liver failure, cirrhosis, alcoholism, leaving two remaining, Jerry and Kevin. Uncle Kevin was the only person in my life to go to all nine of my, all, all, all six of my first psych ward stage before he got sick. He would send Jerry in his place before he died of pancreatic cancer for the seventh and the eighth. And um, the alcoholism riddled my father's family. My father, Patrick, was a primary alcoholic until he met my mom, Debbie. They were second grade sweethearts, pardon me, until he got married to her in 1972, but they were second grade sweethearts. I don't know how that works, you tell me, that doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> Debbie would go over to Pat's house on a regular basis as, as children, and she would ask him the same question. Kevin, or Patrick, why are there so many picture frames on the wall, on every wall, on every level of the wall? And he would never tell her the answer, until one day he decided to be truthful. He took his finger, placed it on the corner of the frame, tilted it to the other side, behind it a hole in the drywall the size of Mickey Kirk and Hines' fist, my father's father, where he would aim for my father's head and often connect. That was my dad's life growing up. His father would go out, his father would get drunk, and his father would come home, and his father would beat him. And my dad never hit me once, but he yelled. He was a yeller. And it affected me. I'm a sensitive kid. And uh, <laughs> I'll tell you, my dad, uh, he would do this. He would, you never knew if you were in trouble or if it was a, a, just a simple good thing. He would come out and you'd run upstairs. He'd like, what, what did I do now? He'd be like, Kevin, did I have a cup of tea? But like, good Lord, man. <laughs> Give me a heart attack. But, uh, but my dad, uh, he did still have a heart of gold. And growing up in his home after leaving my mom's was really tough because all we did was yell at each other fighting tooth and nail every day, screaming matches, police should have been called, so it's, it's a wonder they weren't. And then at 19, at 19 my brain broke again. I couldn't bear the weight of my depression any longer. I felt I was useless. I thought I had no value. I perceived myself a burden to everyone who loved me, and I thought that I had to die. Let me make it abundantly clear. When I went to the Golden Gate Bridge to jump off, I never wanted to die by my hands. I absolutely believed I had to, two categorically different things. At 19, on September 24th of the year 2000, I wrote that note. That note to my mom and my dad, and my brother and my sister, and my best friend Jake Lewis, and my girlfriend, slash ex-girlfriend, it was biblical, depending on who you ask. I wrote that note, Mom, I love you, but you're not always right. I said, Dad, I love you too, but stop bringing the office home, it's just work. I said to my brother, Joseph, you'd be a household name, you want to be a DJ. You want to be, you, you be a DJ. He was playing those mixed cassette tapes when they were still hot. <laughs> who amongst you still plays mixed cassette tapes? <laughs> I see one person, please, dear God. <laughs> one person, there we go. It's not dead yet, thank, thank the Lord. I'm gonna frog in my throat that won't go away. I said to my best friend, Jake Lewis, arguably the worst part of the entire note, you'll find another best friend. As if that's remotely how it works. 
Put that note in my shoulder bag. Put that shoulder bag by the door. At six in the morning, I entered my father Patrick's room. He's lying there sleeping, wearing that breathing apparatus with those CPAP machines. He's wearing that CPAP machine, and he sounds like this. <laughs> a CPAP machine is supposed to keep you from snoring. Not that hot as he wears it defective. He doesn't care at all. It's, it doesn't matter to him. And, and he sounds like Darth Vader snoring, by the way. And I startled him awake, and he immediately looks up, looks at me, and says, Kevin, what's wrong? I said, nothing, Dad. I just wanted to tell you that I love you. In my mind, it was for the very last time. He said, well, Kevin, I love you too. But it's 6 in the morning, and I don't have to be at work until 9 to go back to bed. And he fell as soundly asleep as quickly as he had awoken with his mask back on. And he was good at that. It was like a talent he had. It was a gift. I walked around the other side of the bed, and I sat on the carpeted floor, and I rocked my body back and forth in tears, begging myself to tell the one man who loved me the most in the entire world the truth. But did I? No. No, I buried it, and I silenced my pain. If you all are going to learn one thing from me today, and one thing alone, may I ask that it be this. When you walk out of these doors, and you go about the rest of your natural and beautiful lives, do me a solid, and I don't care if you are the toughest person in every room, never again silence your pain. Your pain is valid. Your pain is worthy of my time and others, and your pain matters, simply because all of you do. When we silence our pain, when we bury it, it only festers and bubbles and grows, and then it bursts with things like rage, aggression, Violence, substance use disorder, suicidal thoughts, ideas, or actions, eating disorder. Some of the greatest liars we know. If we can recognize at the base of this pain that we hold value, that we are worthy, and that we do matter, we can always survive it. I wish I knew that back then. At 19, on the 24th, 5th of September, I got on a bus. I sat in the very back row in the middle seat looking out upon everyone like I am right now. A hundred people boarded that bus and I began to cry. Softly, moderately, waterfalls flowing from my eyes and mucus dripping from my nose. And then I began to yell aloud at the voices I was hearing in my head, auditory hallucinations that had become rampant. In fourth grade, I couldn't understand what they were saying. Now I knew exactly what they wanted me to do, to die with my hands. They told me it was inevitable. I sat on that bus and I yelled, leave me alone, but I don't want to die. I'm a good person. Why do you hate me so much? What did I ever do to you? And now if they weren't before, 100 people are looking down the barrel of the bus and beep and saying absolutely nothing except for one man. The man to my left says to the fellow next to him while pointing at me with his thumb with a smile on his face. What the hell's wrong with that kid? And that, my newfound friends, is what's wrong with some people in society today. This innate human ability to see somebody, anybody, in the greatest lethal emotional pain they've ever experienced, but feel nothing for them but fear of them and apathy toward them. That's his or her problem, but it ain't mine. I got things to do to people to see and places to go. I formidably disagree with that notion. I believe like I, I think you believe, that if we are nothing else on this gorgeous planet, we are at the very least supposed to be one thing together, our brothers and sisters and individuals keepers. Do you agree? <laughs> we are not here for personal betterment or gain. We are here to give back to those we know, those we love, those we don't know from Adam, and yes, those we don't even like. What we're not here to do is hurt each other with our words and our actions. On that note, by a raise of hands, how many of you have ever been hurt by someone you know or love's words or actions? Truthfully. Keep that hand up for a moment. Keep it up. How many of you have ever hurt someone you know or love with your words or actions? Truthfully. Here we go. Keep it up. Keep up. Now, the, 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 my next question. I'm going to give you the answer to my next question. The answer to my next question is a loud audible, resounding now from all of you. The answer to my next question is now. 
When does the hurting of those we know and love with our words and actions stop? Now. It has to. So when you go home today, I want you to consider something just for today. Maybe even going forward, actually. Consider calling three to five people you haven't talked to in a long time that you love that you don't want to talk to because you're mad at them. Consider calling those people and telling them one thing, that you love them, that you forgive them, that you can move forward. You never know what life you could be changing forever. People hold guilt, they hold shame, they hold anger and rage for other people, they hold discomfort, but if we all got together and said no more, what a beautiful world this would be. I didn't know any of that on the day I went to the Golden Gate Bridge. My brain told me I had to die, and I believed it. The voices in my head told me I was useless, and I heeded them. The voice in my head said, jump now, and I did. I stood on that bridge after getting off that bus. That bus had 100 people on it, and they all deboarded that bus with their fanny packs that were multicolored and different from 1987 and their foreign accents from all over the world, and their cameras your kids wouldn't understand because they weren't yet phones. <laughs> and they got off that bus, and I was the last person to get off that bus, hoping, wishing, and praying that the driver would see me, see my pain, and say something kind. Hey, kid, are you okay? Brother, is something wrong? How can I help you? And I would have told the person who asked me that everything and begged them to save me. But the driver just looked at me. He said, come on, kid, get off the bus. i got to go. I walked right up to this man. I looked him right in his eyes, water poured from mine, and he motioned for me to get off the bus. I walked down those two steps that felt like 2,000. I walked across the two mile stretch of walkway that is the Golden Gate Bridge, crying like a child, hoping, wishing, and praying that one person would stop me and save me. I couldn't save myself. And that's when a woman to my left approached me. She had blonde, curly hair. And those sunglasses you ladies love to wear in the heat that absolutely do not fit your face. <laughs> you look like human bugs. <laughs> Something to consider for next time. <laughs> and she approached with a smile, and I thought, this is it. This lady's going to save me. I don't have to die today. I left it all up in her incapable hands. Nobody taught this woman suicide prevention tactics. No one taught her how to see someone who is in such desperate pain. How would she know what to do or say? She walked up, she pulled out a digital camera, and she said, will you take my picture? I had to laugh on the inside, like, lady, this, this is terrible time. <laughs> so I took her camera, and she stood in front of me where I was going to end my life, and she posed five times. I mean, real, real poses, like legit poses, like she was some kind of model. And I'm standing there thinking, well, now I'm thinking, you know, Instagram didn't exist. What were you doing? But nonetheless. That wasn't a bad one, come on. <laughs> and so, and so she ta I take her pictures, and she says thank you, and she walks away. But not 20 yards off the bridge, she walked back across the entire two mile stretch of walkway. Which is what people did at what was called the ninth wonder of the world, the Golden Gate Bridge. What some call the most beautiful man-made structure ever created. Clearly they haven't been to Wilmington, Delaware. <laughs> And, and, uh, and clearly that person who said that was a San Francisco, anyway. And so, she walked away. I said nobody cares. I ran back toward the traffic ground. I sprinted forward and I catapulted myself into free fall. But the millisecond my hands left that ramp and my legs cleared it, it was an instantaneous regret for my actions and the 100% recognition that I had just made the greatest mistake of my life, and it was too late. 99% of those who have jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge never get to tell their stories. They're gone. 99% of those who have left off that bridge have never seen the light of day since. 39 individuals have survived that fall in 83 years. Of the 39 survivors of that jump, I was number 26. 25 of the 39 survivors remain alive today. Many have died of natural causes and aged out and got old, old, died of old age. Um, 
But the 25 that remain alive today, after I came forward to say, I had an instantaneous regret for my action, that 19 of the 25 came forward to say the exact same thing. Instant regret in their actions. And the 100% recognition after they jumped that they made the greatest mistake of their life. Why? Because they finally recognized their thoughts did not have to become their Exactly. I fell 220 feet, 25 stories, at 75 miles an hour in four seconds. In those four seconds, these were the words that rang true in my mind. What have I just done? I don't want to die. God, please save me. I hit the water. Upon impact, I shattered my T12, L1, L2 low vertebrae discharge like last. They, they splintered inside me. I missed separating my spinal cord that day by two millimeters. Do me a favor, my friends, show me a millimeter with your hands. And just remember I can see you, so I know who's not doing <laughs> I went down 70 feet beneath the water surface and I opened my eyes. I was drowning. And I'll never forget the thought, I don't want to drown. Why'd you jump into a giant body of water? And, 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 and the illogical thought, irrational thought leads to suicidal ideation, not rational, logical thought is my point. I frantically swam in any direction I was going down. My eyes began to bulge. My ears began to ring. I knew my mistake. I shot what I believed to be the surface as fast as my arms would take me. I could not feel my legs. I got closer and closer to the lit circle of water above me. And I thought, I'm not going to make it. This is where I die. I started to convulse. And I said to myself, Kevin, you can't die here. If you die here, Kevin, no one will ever know you didn't want to. No one will ever know you knew you made a mistake. I broke the surface of the water, I bobbed up and down the water, and I did the one thing I've had control over since kindergarten. I prayed. God, please save me. I don't want to die. I made a mistake on repeat, and I believe he heard me. In the water, as I flailed to stay afloat, something began to circle beneath me. Something large and slimy and very much alive. I'll never forget that because I was freaking out. I thought, you've got to be kidding me. I didn't die jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge and a shark is going to eat me. And I'm punching this thing, but it won't go away. It circles faster and faster, faster and faster. No longer am I wading in the water or struggling to stay afloat. I'm lying on my back atop the water, being kept buoyant by this creature, thinking to myself, this is one heck of a nice shark. I did what any human being would do in that situation. Right then, right there, I named him Herbert. <laughs> because what else was I going to do? Is that a border would have an old-timey name. Before this creature came to my aid, a woman driving by in a red car saw me go over the bridge at the moment of my attempt and called her friend from her car phone, yes, car phone in the year 2000, called her friend from her car phone in the United States Coast Guard. The only reason the Coast Guard got to my body within less than the time I was set to hypothermia and drown a three minute window was because of that woman making that phone call. Then in the water, this creature keeps me afloat until the Coast Guard boat arrives behind me. The Coast Guard officers fish me onto a flat board, put me in a neck brace, strap me into head to toe, and start asking questions. Oh. Kid, do you know what you just did? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they said, why? And I had no real answer. I said, I don't know. I thought I had to die today. The senior officer leans in and says, Son, do you understand how many people we pull out of these waters that are already gone? I said, No, sir, and I don't want to know. He said, I'm going to tell you anyway. He said, Young man, this unit alone has pulled 57 dead bodies from these waters and one live one. I think they call that perspective, right? Yes. Call that perspective. And uh, they got me to the hospital at Marine General. <clears throat> As I was entering the ward at Marine General, one of the greatest, most prominent back surgeons was leaving. One of the best back surgeons on, that, on, the, on, the coast, on the West Coast was leaving for the day to go do something else, to go be somewhere else. He saw me, did me a solid, and opted to stay. He went into my left hand side with his team. 23 stable scar I could never forget. There's no amount of a is gonna make it go away. <laughs> a 
a 23 stable scar I'll never forget. It went to my left side, took out all the shattered pieces of vertebrae, mashed them into a paste. I imagine it was some kind of mortar and pestle or something like that, I don't know. And mashed them into a paste, took out three inches of my 10th rib, mashed that into a paste, took a cylindrical cage of mesh wiring and wrapped it around with vertebrae work, four pins the size of my index finger, and a metal plate the size of my palm on my left side. The singular reason I get the distinct honor and privilege to stand before you or anyone today is because of this man and his team. My friends, I'm making a point. I get to be here. And getting to be here is a privilege and a gift, no matter the pain you are in. I've been in pain, arguably, since the day I was born in the Tenderloin of San Francisco in a crack hotel. But I've never suffered a day in my life. I've been given the second chance out there. I'm grateful for every millisecond I get to walk this green earth. Every place I get to go is a beautiful one because I almost didn't get to go. Everything I get to do is amazing because it almost didn't happen. Most importantly, each and every one of you are a gift to me. I almost never got to meet you. It wasn't easy after the Golden Gate Bridge. It, things just didn't just turn up all roses and cheery-eyed. No, it was really, really hard, and it is really, really hard. I live with this diagnosis every day. I live with severe thoughts of suicide on a regular basis. I live with hallucinations, auditory and visual. Every symptom I've ever had of that disease follows me until today. But I know how to fight it. It all occurred in my third of eight of nine now psych ward stays. In my third of nine psych ward stays, I had what I call my epiphany and my gift. The epiphany came in the form of my uncle George on my mom's side. Uncle George would come to the psych ward stays every psych ward stay to make me laugh. He would make fun of me in front of my other friends and thought that was hilarious. Uh, you know, that's that's his way of showing love. Uncle George, if you if you met Uncle George today, he would look at you. He would assess you in 30 seconds, and then he would offend you, not sensibly, to your core. He'd offend you to your core, and then five minutes later, you'd be his best friend. That's how Uncle George works. And, and so he comes in to my third psych ward stay of, of, of nine, and he says, Kevin, your family can help you until we're blue in the face. But until and when you take 100% responsibility, young man, for this disease, and you fight it tooth and nail, can ain't nothing going to change. You'll be in and out of these places for the rest of your life. Is that what you want? I said, no, Uncle George. said, well, get it together, kid. We're counting on you. <clears throat> he, he had a rolled up magazine in his left hand. He dropped the magazine like a mic drop on the table, and he got up and he left. And I thought, what is this guy? And he got up and he left, and he got to the door, and there was a 67-year-old Spanish woman named Gloria who's arguably going to be in there for the rest of her life. He said, Kevin, do you want to be like this? I said, no, Uncle George. He said, well, get it together, kid. We're counting on you. And he did leave. And I yelled out, you're not my favorite uncle anymore. <laughs> he was already gone. I picked up the Time Magazine article. I picked it up. And I read the magazine. And it was a Time Magazine article on fighting bipolar disorder, depression, a mental illness with routine and regimen and winning. I thought, you mean I can do these things? And I can feel better most of the time? Heck, at least some of it? And so I read the article through and through twice, and I put my words into action, the words on the page into action. I went to my case manager, and I said, listen, uh, I'm not sleeping well. What can you do for me? He said, I've got these pills. He said, no, no, I'm finally taking my medication with 100% accuracy every day at the same time of day without fail. Give me something natural for my sleep. And she said, I've got you covered. She gave me a CD player from Walgreens. You guys know those. Not, not CD players, Walgreens. Just kidding. No, Walgreens lives in a CD player. And so she said, you hear it's rain, chorus, uh, whale, and ocean noises, music, alter, uh, proven to alter brain waves, sleep habits, sleep functions. I said, this is a bunch of nonsense. I started to play the songs 20 minutes before I go to sleep every night on a timer. I was asleep within two weeks. All right, insomnia was gone. Now, what's next? I'm, I'm overweight, I'm pre-diabetic, and they, I, I went to the nurse's station, I said, I'd like to use your gym facility. They said, son, this is a psych ward. I said, every psych ward should have a gym. It's in the magazine. <laughs> <laughs> and then I remembered, I was a WCAL wrestling champion. I had to get my body, get to the ground, and get to work because I'm physically capable. I'm lucky to be so. So I got to work. Every single day I wasn't in therapy. Every moment I wasn't doing therapy, I was on the ground getting the work done. I lost the weight. I went to my nurse's station. 
I said, listen, after all of this stuff, after exercising every day, eating healthier foods, educating myself as to the nature of bipolar disorder, reading every book I could on the topic, I started getting better. I was feeling great. And then this kid rolls in on a gurney one day, catatonic. He can't move and he can't talk. Methamphetamines and another drug. But this kid was special. Filipino Spanish, Spanish American family, and every single day, 15 to 22 people would come to see this kid. 15 to 22 people that loved him would come to see him in a cycle. Nobody comes to see you in a cycle. Trust me, I know. But this kid had an entourage every day. But nobody was taking care of this kid in the hospital. He couldn't take care of himself, so he was ignored. I hated that. I would sit with him breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I would tell him stories every day. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Story after about Kevin, about my dad, about myself. One day, two weeks in, this is what the kid does. Jeez, man. You talk too much. <laughs> Leave me alone. You wanted nothing to do with me. I did a happy dance. People were clapping in the bathroom. If I'm honest, it was the lady that's always clapping, which meant it for me, I can tell. Anyway. I go up to the nurse's station one day, and I say to the nurse's station, I say to, uh, to uh, my case manager, Jana, from Brooklyn, I said, Jana, you know, I really like to have a job. She goes, what now? I said, Jana, you got me doing these, you know, uh, all these therapies. You got me doing 10 therapies. Give me five forms of therapy and give me a job, like, like a volunteer position. She goes, you want to volunteer for the psych ward you are staying in? I said, yeah. She said, no. That's Italian. That's probably illegal. That's not going to happen. I said, well, can I have a hug? She goes, what? I said, 23 second hugs, release oxytocin in the brain to make you feel better. It's in the magazine. She said, get away from me. <laughs> but the next day, Jana went on vacation, and the new case manager came in, and it was great. She was a certified hippie from 1967 San Francisco, and she'd seen death been through it all. She had a tie-dye shirt, a lay of flowers around her neck that she hand-picked from her garden that morning and every morning, a flower in her right ear, salt and pepper, curly cr fried hair out to here. And I walked up to her and her, and her granola self, and I was like, hey, listen, uh, I want a job. And she goes, you want to volunteer for the sunny board? I said, yes, yeah. this sounds like a lovely idea. <laughs> what can we have you do? And she goes back and she grabs a giant green binder among 22 other giant green binders, and she says, I know. You can file these. I said, what are they? She said, oh, you know, patient binders. Have you ever heard of HIPAA privacy laws? Do that, that's highly illegal. She said, just do it alphabetically and don't look at the details. <laughs> you know me, I did it alphabetically and I did not look at most of the details. I wouldn't do it. I finished the binders and gave my next job. Clean up the giveaway clothes closet. When you leave the hospital, you got something to wear. I go, I box, bin, label everything, separate it out, male, female, other, and I realize some, all of the men's stuff fits me. So I do what any of us would do, any, uh, any of the men would do. I'd come out of the closet, well, you heard me, with a round of red, <laughs> double breasted polo suit, and a 70s yellow flared collar, like some kind of gangster on the place. And I'd walk up to the nurse's station, and I'd buy a finger discount and a notebook with a clipboard and a pen. And I, and I do the new, I'm now the hospital documentee. Leonardo the Ninja Turtle is looking solid. <laughs> that, that's what it happens. In walks pragmatic, pessimistic, stone faced Pat Hines, also wearing a suit, except he's a businessman and I'm a total fraud. He can't see me on the other end of the psych nurse's station because he has no peripheral vision. And he looks at this lady and it's at the nurse's station and says, Excuse me, I'd like to see my son Kevin, please. Very proper. And uh, she goes like this, mm hmm. <laughs> and, points at me. and he looks at me and he goes, he does one of his double takes like this. He goes like that, and he says one of his favorite mantras. Kevin, what the hell are you doing? And I'm over here and I go, Dad, I work here now. And he goes, what? Like little John the Rapper. Like he said, what? And he goes, get me the manager. And she goes, sir, this is not a hotel. And he said, get me the head nurse now. Gets to the head nurse once. It was her, and she wasn't happy that she was tougher than he was. They're going at it, and that's when I said, that's it! No more Pat Hines. I did not think security would forcibly remove my father like I had authority over them. <laughs> they did. They forced him to remove my dad. It was a bad scene. He was really upset. I hurt his feelings. Don't worry, we laugh about it today. When I say we, I laugh about it when he stares at me angrily. <laughs> so, <but laughs> they kicked my dad out the very next day. 
Uh, I'm at the nurse's station, and I get a tap on my left shoulder giving the morning busy the hour announcements. And I turn around, and there she was. Her, her name was Margaret. Her eyes were almond brown, sexy, and cool, and I was done. I knew right there she'd be the rest of my life. I quickly said to myself, Kevin, whatever you do, don't tell her that. That would be awkward. <laughs> and, and she says to me like this, excuse me, do you work here? I, I just, I was hooked, and I said, uh, as a matter of fact, Miss, and the entire nurse's staff was there. And they were looking at me like, what is this little turd going to say? And I looked at all of them like, you best all be very quiet right now while the long talk about the binders. They were pressing laws. <laughs> and that's when, uh, that's when they were quiet. And then I said, as a matter of fact, Miss, I am a volunteer. And she said, I'm looking for my cousin. His name it was that kid. This was her first time coming to see him. It was her cousin. I said, Madam, right this way. And I walked her there like this. <laughs> I thought it was regal. She told me it was just playing creepy with a capital K. <laughs> I get her into the room. The kid sees me, and she, he said, he, she says to him, your nursing staff is so nice. I, I'm wearing regular clothes. Everyone else is wearing hospital gowns. And, and, and he goes, that guy? That guy's a nutball. That guy jumps off bridges. Don't talk to that guy. And I ran in there and said, excuse me, excuse me. It was one. It was one bridge. Plural. That's ridiculous. <laughs> she comes out to the room. She goes, she goes why'd you lie to me? I said, Mark, I didn't lie to you. I'm a volunteer at this very hospital. I just happen to also live here. <laughs> so one day, Margaret comes into the hospital. I stop her short at the door. I said, Margaret, when I get out of here, could I like take you to coffee? And she goes, oh, honey, hell no. <laughs> but I was a persistent person, and persistence is the key with love, mental health, and psych wards. And so I, I, you know, I, I get out of the psych ward, I go to my halfway home for the mentally ill, I've got 30 days probationary period until I can get my first weekend off. Now my first weekend off, who do I call? Margaret. You're all right, I call Margaret. I call Margaret, this is the conversation we have. Hi, Margaret, it's, it's Kevin. Um, Kevin? <laughs> Kevin Hines? Um, from the psych ward? <laughs> Hi, Kevin, how are you? How did you get this phone number? That's unimportant. Let's move on. Margaret, uh, I got to take you to dinner. It's Friday. And she goes, uh, oh, you know, Margaret, listen, I, I just want to go on one day. You go south, you never have to see me again. Just give me this one shot, I kind of need it. And she goes, oh, uh, okay. And so we go, uh, and I show up at her apartment, ready to go to dinner, that she, she made reservations. I go show up at the apartment, and there was a problem. Ladies, you'll understand uh, I had a giant ski double bag of lots of my things. Don't judge yet. And she goes, what is that? I said, right, it's, a, it's a funny story. When you leave the halfway home on a Friday, you make reservations today, and, and you go out. Uh, past 9 p.m., you made them at 9 p.m. You kind of can't go back to the halfway home till Monday. <laughs> she goes, oh, hell no! I said, well, I'll take this bag. I will lay out the, uh, the bag across the street on a pillow and go to sleep over there in the rain if I have to. If we have to go to this date, I came all this way. And she goes, oh, God, fine. So we go to this restaurant, Cafe Sport in San Francisco, that you don't order at. They look at you, they judge you, and they order for you. San Francisco. And, and it's an old mob hanging out, and you go there, and the tables are the size of the seats of your chairs. And they order Margaret an eggplant parmesan dish, simple, plain, fit on the table. This guy didn't like me at all. I was the new guy. He orders me a giant bed of spaghetti, a mountain of marinara sauce, a marinara sauce, a huge uncracked lobster, a boat of a candle, a plate with boiling butter, and an oddly cut oven wedge like a purpose. I am wearing my only good white shirt. I found an old navy on sale at the current track for $5. I live off of $3 a day at the half well, That's a two-day shirt, okay? And I'm freaking out because if I get anything on this shirt, she's going to think I'm a total slob. But I'm focused. I do my positive affirmations. I take the cracker. I go for the tail. Crack, marinara sauce all over. I only get my shirt. It was like Captain America's shield and a shirt. Nothing can get off with water. And, and, uh, and that, that I said to myself, Kevin, do something classy right now. I grabbed the lemon wedge. I picked it up. And I started to shake because I looked at her almond brown sex and cool eyes. And I went like this. And I suppose that lemon harder than lemon has ever been squeezed. That's a word. It's a word in the real English dictionary. Look it up. It's next to frozen. Let it go. Let it go. Anyway, 
I scroll into that lemon, and I watch a stream of lemon juice fly directly into Margaret's left eye. And then she comes over with my dead fire hose. Mascara is running down her face. She's like, man, this is the film of the crow. I'm freaking out. And that's when this lady decides to get involved. Matthew, you okay? Hey, Smoker67, it's a date. It's going to be south. They're not healthy. Thank you. And then I, I, I'm freaking out, and my mind said, Kevin, do something classier right now. And yes, I went for the plate of boiling butter. Yeah, it gets a lot worse. I took the plate, I watched two drops of boiling butter fly across the table between her blouse onto her chest and they burn her and she screams bloody murder. The restaurant stops cold. But I'm a gentleman. I grab a napkin and I reached over. Her. And she looks down and she says, what are you doing? I said, I don't know, I have no idea what I'm doing. She says, the only two words in the first 10 minutes of the meal, when you haven't eaten your food, check, please, that you never want to hear. I'm freaking out. We walk back to the apartment. She walks a mile in front of me. Like, I don't know that guy. And uh, I'm thinking, we're not gonna, we're not gonna get married. We're not gonna have the six kids I imagine. Three girls, three boys, Captain Dave. We're not gonna have the dog named Max, he was a sharp pay. All those wrinkles look just like that. No, we get to the apartment and she goes, Kevin, we're going to the roof. I said, Margaret, are you going to throw me off? <laughs> she said, no, Kevin, we get to the room, yoga mat, and a box garden. I said, we do a nighttime yoga garden. She said, no, Kevin, lay down. We lay down awkward silence with balls. I said, Margaret, what are we doing here? She goes, Kevin, all we do right now is stare at that full moon. Ain't nothing else can go wrong. <laughs> Needless to say, I told Margaret on our second date that I loved her. And that was that went really, really well. She went like this. <laughs> um, thank you. But we are now 15 years together and 13 years married. She's the love of my life and my very best friend, Margaret. <laughs> I don't tell you that story to brag about my love life. I tell you that story to show you that just because you're going through hell today doesn't mean you don't get to have that beautiful tomorrow. But you have to be here to get there in the first place. Ladies and gentlemen, my new family and friends, be here tomorrow, and every single day after that, you are valued, you are worthy, you matter, and you are important to me. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for listening, I appreciate you.